Welcome to day 251 of our scripture reading and daily encouragement. Today we're going to cover Isaiah 65 and 66, which finishes up that book of Isaiah. Then we're going to jump over and start a new book, 2 Thessalonians, and cover chapter 1. Now, Isaiah starts off today with something very profound. He says that God says, I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. Did you hear that? God himself is saying, I was ready. I was ready, but no one asked. So my question is, if you ever found yourself in a situation that you would love to help someone, but they never asked for your help. Or maybe you've been in a situation where you needed help and there were people ready to help you, but you didn't ask for their help. You know, I think one of the things that we gotta be very careful of is one of the signs of pride is not asking for help. And many of us struggle with that. Maybe we don't think we need help. That's pride. Or maybe we think that we aren't good enough to ask for help. That's kind of the other extreme, and that's rejection. So on one side, we don't ask for help because we have pride that we can do it all. But on the other side, the other extreme, we have this rejection that we don't deserve help. But for whatever reason, we struggle with asking for help. We have people ready and willing to help us if we just ask. Now, can you imagine Having God, the creator of the universe, being at that point of the helpful friend. But then no one asked for his help. So if there's just one thing I can encourage you with today, just one thing, and we stop there, it would be the fact that the creator of everything, the creator of the universe, Yahweh, the great I am, he is ready to help each of us. He's ready to be found. We just have to call on him. We either have to drop our pride that we can do this life by ourselves without his help. Or we need to drop our rejection that we don't deserve his help. So again, guys, we got to be careful that we're not too prideful to ask God for help. And we got to be careful we're, that we're not at a point that we don't feel good enough for his help. God's people have been rebellious and stubborn for hundreds of years. And yet he still wanted to help them here in Isaiah. So guys, it doesn't matter where you are. Be willing to stop and ask God for his help. He is waiting for you to ask. He is ready to help you. You just have to ask him. Now here's the other side of that coin. We've talked lately about a coin that has two sides. Here's the other side of that coin. God expects you to be devoted to him. He expects you to be obedient to him. He expects us to worship him when he helps us. He is ready to help. But there's a part that we have to do as well. But look at his people that he's talking to here. They had done none of those things for quite some time. But he was still there to help them. And all he wanted was for them to turn back to him and ask for his help. But as we know with the story, they didn't ask for his help. They didn't turn away from their evil ways. So here's the beauty of the next piece. He says he won't completely destroy Israel because he still has some servants there. So God is willing to help them. He's there to help him. No one's looking for him, he says. No one's asking. But he's not going to turn away from them because there are still some servants there that are looking for him. So the general whole is not, the whole of the people are not looking for him, but there are still some servants there looking for him, serving him, being obedient to him. And we've, we've used this term before, but God says he will not destroy Israel because of the remnant. The remnant are still faithful to him. So this is part of our encouragement today. No matter what's going on around you, no matter, what, no matter who is falling away, God is always looking for those that remain faithful, even if it's just a few, even if it's just a remnant. And today I'm letting that be an encouragement to me to remain faithful and true to God. Even when I see those around me fall away. Even when I see those around me, churches, pastors, other Christians twist and pervert the gospel to what they want. I'm going to stay strong and remain faithful and be that remnant. I'm going to ask God for help. I'm going to drop my pride. I'm going to drop my rejection. And I'm going to ask God to help me in everything. 
Now here in Isaiah, God is promising to be there for those that seek and serve him. And he promises a great reward for those that remain faithful as he punishes those who aren't. So God, guys, I know which side I want to be on. I want to be on the reward side for sure, not the punishment side. In the final chapter of Isaiah, chapter 66, we get a promise and warnings. In verse 2, we get the promise. The Lord says, I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts. Contrite means remorseful, or it can mean lame as in an injury. So God is saying he will bless those with humble and remorseful hearts. He will bless those that are looked at as lame, so to speak. Those who tremble at his word, he says. I will bless those who tremble at my word. Those who take his word seriously. But those who choose, but here's the but, but here's a bad but. (laughs) But those who choose their ways over mine, those that delight in the sins I've warned about, the sins that I've said are detestable, will not have their offerings accepted. And at this point, Isaiah ends the book with warnings that go all the way to the end of the chapter of what happens if you don't ask God for help, if you don't remain obedient, if you're not part of that remnant. And he ends with verse 24 as a warning about hell. And guys, this is the same verse that Jesus referenced when he described hell to his disciples in Mark 9, 47 and 48. So as we finish Isaiah today, Let's take his words. This book has been full of encouragement to obey God, full of warnings if we don't. Let's take his words, his warnings very seriously. As I mentioned the day we began Isaiah, this book is alive. This book is full of prophecies about Jesus. It's full of prophecies about Jesus' return. It's full of verses that Jesus himself referenced and quoted. It's not some old history book. This book is alive. If we take the words of Isaiah seriously, we will serve God. We will be obedient to God. We will be a remnant when others turn away. And we will reach out and we will ask God for his help when we are in times of need. So take the warning seriously here from Isaiah. But be greatly encouraged that you and I are part of his remnant if we remain faithful. Now we're going to jump over into the New Testament. And as we jump into 2 Thessalonians, I need to give you a little backstory on the timing and purpose of this book. So Paul wrote his first letter to them, 1 Thessalonians. We just covered that. And we mentioned yesterday that he told them that Jesus will come back in a moment. Jesus will come back and snatch them up. And they would join Jesus in the sky. The dead will be snatched up. Then the people alive. Pretty much immediately after Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonica church, false teachers came along and said things like, Hey, Jesus came back. You missed him. So now we got this church at Thessalonica that's terrified that they missed Jesus' return. Paul has written to them to tell them what it's going to look like, give them hope. Then they got a false teacher that comes along and says, you missed it. So Paul had to write this second letter to them. And it's actually thought that it was written very soon after the first letter, maybe like a month later, maybe a few weeks. We don't know exactly, but it's written very soon after the first letter, very quickly by the standards of that time. So that he could let them know that they hadn't missed anything. Don't worry, guys. You haven't missed anything. And we really won't see that specifically until we get into chapter 2, which is tomorrow. And that's where Paul tells them not to be alarmed. They haven't missed anything. They haven't missed Jesus. But in chapter 1, he starts off by just simply encouraging them. He says, we can't help but thank God for you. Because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. So even in the face of persecution and thinking they missed Jesus, their faith remained strong. Their love remained strong for each other. Paul says, we proudly tell others about the persecution and hardships that you're enduring because of your faith. See, guys, this church was a model. This church was a model to other churches of how to endure, how to remain faithful in the times of persecution. And Paul wanted to remind them, we're thankful for you. We're encouraging you. At a time that you're questioning if you've missed the grand finale, so to speak, we're thanking God for you. So Paul says, don't worry. God will give you rest from your persecution when Jesus returns. See, that's his first statement that would have really resonated with them. He says, when Jesus returns. Remember, they had been misled that it already happened. So this is probably a good time to remind you and myself that not everyone who comes in the name of Jesus is coming in the name of the true Jesus, Yeshua. 
See, there will be many false teachers, false prophets, false apostles. Satan will place them there, and it's hard for us to get our minds around this, but he will place them there, and they will look like a light. They will mimic Jesus, but they will be giving a false message, and that's what was happening to this church. They're not coming in the name of the true Jesus, Yeshua. They are coming in the name of Satan, the false light, and they're mimicking Jesus, and they're trying to confuse us as Christians. It was happening 2,000 years ago, and it's still happening today. So part of what we need to pray for is discernment and knowledge to understand the difference between someone who is giving us a true message in Jesus and a false message. If it can't be rooted in this scripture, that's a clear indication that it's false. And there are many false teachers out there today that are worshipped, that are listened to. They're professing the name of Jesus, but it's a false Jesus. But Paul is promising the church in Thessalonica when Jesus returns... You will be part of those snatched up. You will be part of those rapturoed, harpazoed. If you don't know those words, you need to go back and listen to yesterday where we explained those. He says this day will include you. So he's reassuring them that they've done nothing wrong. They haven't missed anything. He really says it in detail in chapter 2, but he's starting that discussion here in chapter 1. And Paul's encouraging them, keep doing what you're doing. Don't get discouraged. And I think many of us need to hear that today. You may, you may not be thinking that you miss Jesus' return, but it's easy for us to get discouraged today. It's easy for us to get discouraged when we face persecution, when we face hardships. But maybe, just maybe, you are the model that someone is watching. Maybe you don't even realize who's watching you and what your faith and your perseverance and your endurance is showing them. Remember, this Christian life, this Christian faith, this being a believer, follower of Jesus is not about what you can say or recite. It's about your actions. It's about your actions matching up to what you say or recite that prove your faith. If people see you persevering and remaining faithful, it can give them hope for their own perseverance. So today, I encourage you, the same way Paul encouraged this church, Keep persevering. Keep having strong faith. Keep loving each other well. And wait with anticipation for that day when we get to meet up with Jesus. I hope you're encouraged today, and I hope you have a great day.